questions for you to ponder over over the next talk, and uh, the votes will win. So the first uh, clinical case is a 35-year-old right-handed woman uh, who was normal about 50 minutes ago. She's a violinist by trade, presents with left arm sensory loss and subtle grip strength weakness without any drift. She scores a one on the NIH stroke scale. Her CTA shows right M1 occlusion. So what would you do? Number two is a 75-year-old right-handed man. He was normal about two hours ago, comes in with an acute syncope episode, and presents with severe vertigo and inability to walk. His NIH stroke scale is a two for uh, dysmetria, and his CTA shows the top of the basilar thrombus. And the third case is a 95-year-old right-handed woman. She lives in a nursing home. She's found to have left upper extremity weakness when she went to lunch, observed by the RN. Her last known well is about four hours ago when she was checked on in the morning. Her NIH stroke scale is a two, and her CT angiogram shows a right M2 occlusion. So we can discuss further after we give our next speaker, Dr. Pinchal. Uh, his most recent title uh, has that, uh, is that he's become a father to a budding vascular neurologist named Shekhar about nine days old, I think, now, so congratulations. Prior to that, and hopefully in continuation after paternity leave, Dr. Pinchal is going to continue to be a stroke neurologist at Houston Methodist, the Woodlands. He graduated from neurology residency here at Houston Methodist in 2019 and then completed his stroke fellowship at Vanderbilt in 2020 with Dr. Zimmerman. He has since joined the stellar Houston Methodist Woodlands neurology team since 2020, and he's going to talk to us about low NIH stroke scale and large vessel occlusions. Wait, wait, wait. Dr. Pinchal? Okay, uh, so my topic is the uh, converse here in terms of what to do for these patients with low NIH stroke scales and large vessel occlusions. Uh, to borrow from Johnny Cochran here, if the NIH doesn't fit, you must resist. Um, and so uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are going to be similar to what Dr. Huang presented here, uh, but we will see where the data takes us. So before we go into further details here, let's kind of talk about foundations and definitions of what low NIH is, what elbow criteria are. Uh, Dr. Huang kind of briefly mentioned these pivotal RCTs that defined uh, uh, what to do in these patients with uh, large vessel occlusions based upon their degree of severity of their symptoms. Uh, they, you know, these trials demonstrated superiority of thrombectomy over medical management alone in these uh, stroke patients with large, large vessels. But they were defined by uh, a very certain uh, trial uh, design. Uh, there were neurogeneration devices used for the thrombectomy, more strict imaging selection criteria, more efficient workflows where there were not as much delays in terms of taking patients from imaging to angio and uh, subsequent intervention. And then more importantly here, there was more strict clinical ex exclusion criteria. Uh, excluding two of the studies here, the NIH stroke seal of less than six, these patients were excluded. And Mr. Clean and Extend IA, I think it went from four and two uh, respectively. Uh, but this kind of defined the guidelines for which these patients with six or greater in their NIH uh, were candidates for and demonstrated good outcomes uh, for intervention. So what defines a low NIH stroke scale? Uh, you know, we are arbitrarily kind of talking about NIH stroke scales less than six, uh, but what really, uh, what does that mean in terms of a clinical description of things? Mild, non-disabling symptoms. If you actually look back in the literature, minor stroke is defined as an NIH stroke scale less than three, Mild stroke is defined as an NIH stroke scale less than eight. And so, you know, as to whether or not this affects decision making, it really kind of comes down to the clinical equipoise of what those, uh, those deficits are that determine what mild and minor symptoms are. Nevertheless, these patients were underrepresented in these initial landmark trials, uh, in those excluding those uh, Mr. Clean and uh, well, actually, no, including Mr. Clean and XNIA, there was only 5% of these patients were represented in the total uh, five trials uh, that made these landmark studies. Uh, however, about 50% of patients with intracranial occlusions have NIH stroke scales less than six, with up to 25% having a proximal occlusion ICAs or M1s, and kind of just strictly speaking about anterior circulation only. So what is the existing data on best medical management here? There really isn't uh, a whole lot here, but there's just more so core studies that define, uh, you know, what, uh, what happens in these patients or what has happened in these patients. Uh, I'll kind of go into what trials are 
uh, underway right now in terms of RCTs, but uh, looking at a couple of cohort studies here, this one was done by Amraj Siraj uh, a couple of years ago, uh, looking at how low can we go with these patients and uh, what happens. And so in this population of patients, uh, the, there was a dichotomized to endovascular patients and then best medical management. Uh, the endovascular patients had, in their first instance, they had best medical therapy, either thrombolytics or antithrombotics, as well as uh, uh, thrombectomy. The, uh, the medical management group underwent just medical management, whatever that was defined as for those patients. There was no rescue thrombectomy performed in these patients if they had any kind of neurological decline. Uh, the inclusion criteria for these patients was just an IH stroke CL less than six. And in terms of the vessel occlusions, they went quite far out. They went uh, M1 to M4s and they included the ACAs. And their outcomes were defined by MRS and kind of uh, what defines excellent and independent. And so what did this find? So there was really no overall treatment effect for thrombectomy in these patients. Uh, with these lower NIH stroke seals. However, it did demonstrate somewhat of a, uh, a statistically significant rate of increased symptomatic hemorrhage uh, compared to those patients who underwent just medical management. So there is a bit of indication here that they, these patients, at least in this cohort, uh, did not benefit but suffered some degree of complications here. Uh, another cohort uh, separate uh, the year before was done as well. This one uh, was not necessarily unique, but uh, more so different in the sense that rescue thrombectomy was performed if these patients had any kind of neurological deterioration, which occurred in about uh, just shy of 20 patients, or 20 percent of patients. Their inclusion criteria in terms of the NIH was a bit higher, uh, going up to seven, uh, less than eight. Um, and their thrombectomies, their occlusion site was a bit more proximal. It only went up to the proximal M2, uh, aside from just the M1 and the ICA. And so these patients, similarly, no significant differences in terms of the patients who underwent best medical therapy versus a mechanical thrombectomy, uh, and even uh, looking at a subgroup of patients uh, just stratifying to NIH stroke seals of four or greater than four, uh, there really wasn't much difference in these patients either. Uh, hemorrhage did occur a bit more frequently in these patients, uh, not enough to uh, attain statistical significance, but did de demonstrate a trend towards that as well. So somewhat in line with the, the previous study as well. Um, something of note in these patients uh, when looking at how they designed or how they looked into their cohort. Uh, so in these patients with NIH stroke seals less than eight in the, their best medical management group, these patients were admitted to the ICU and they underwent sort of a more uh, uh, strict monitoring period where for the first uh, six hours, every 10 minutes, they were checked. Uh, and then every hour afterwards for at least for the next 24 hours after that six hour completion. And in terms of what defined taking a patient for rescue thrombectomy, if there was an increase in the NHF greater than four or it went higher than eight uh, or higher than seven, uh, led to the, uh, them taking the patient for thrombectomy. And the outcome was that, uh, again, about 18% uh, of these patients required this rescue, but while the authors don't specifically provide data in terms of what happened to these patients that required rescue therapy, they do comment in the paper itself that it seemed to be associated to less good results compared to those patients who underwent thrombectomy in the first instance. And so you cannot necessarily, while this is not power to assess these kind of patients who require rescue uh, therapy, uh, it does suggest that even after these patients decline, uh, the question remains as to does that yield any sort of benefit for these patients. And then there was a, uh, a more so of a meta-analysis done uh, by Dr. Goyal uh, a couple of years ago as well, looking at four uh, cohort studies that kind of met what they were looking for, including their own uh, uh, multicenter study. Their inclusion criteria was the NIH less than six, uh, ICAs, M1s, and M2s, and looking at their functional outcome and independence of MRS. Um, Similar trend here in terms of the results. The efficacy profile was similar between thrombectomy patients and those who had best medical management. But again, uh, at least uh, while this, uh, this population of patients and their meta-analyses showed uh, asymptomatic uh, intracranial hemorrhage was having higher rates compared to the symptomatic, nevertheless, there was hemorrhage as a complication in these patients uh, that showed some degree of uh, significance here. And so uh, uh, their meta-analyses portions of the studies, again, uh, similarly showed no association between treatment modality at three-month outcomes for the MRS. Uh, but again, uh, thrombectomy, again, as far as meta-analyses go, 
uh, showed higher odds uh, in unadjusted analysis, but not adjusted. So not necessarily anything to uh, take home. So what is this, where does this all lead us? Where does this uh, kind of take us in terms of future directions here? So going ahead here, you know, the, there clearly needs to be some sort of defined, uh, not just trial, but uh, definitions in terms of what to do for these patients. There are at least two RCTs out right now that are re uh, recruiting endo low and most. And so endo low is looking at patients who present within eight hours uh, who have an NIH stroke CL less than six, uh, comparing uh, thrombectomy to medical management. Um, this, uh, this trial is a bit more specific in terms of uh, what they are doing. Uh, their endovascular group is only using an EmboTrap retriever uh, rather than any sort of device at, at discretion of the interventionalist. Uh, their medical management is just guideline-based care. However, they do allow for rescue thrombectomy, but their definitions are somewhat obscure, they sort of just define if they suffer major neurological worsening that clearly requires intervention, uh, which is not necessarily too clear uh, in terms of specifics. Um, MOST is the other RCT that is out right now in terms of its uh, actively recruiting. Similarly, these patients are NH stroke scale less than six, but they extend it out to 24 hours. Uh, again, the endovascular group here as compared to uh, endolo they can, any thrombectomy device is uh, allowed to be used. And of note, uh, in most, uh, although this is an extended window uh, patient population here, they do not require perfusion imaging uh, to decide to intervene on these patients. Um, for the medical management patients, uh, again, guideline-based care, depending on their timing and what they merit for thrombolytics and uh, thrombotics. Uh, but rescue thrombectomy is allowed in these patients for if they have any kind of deterioration. And so how does this all impact our clinical decision making here? Uh, it kind of goes back to what Dr. Huang was discussing uh, at the end of his talk is that uh, we have to uh, be prudent about what, uh, how our NIH is performed and uh, the accuracy of it as well. Uh, and an age of a four or an aphasia patient uh, you know, may have been graded by someone as having an NH of just a three, but when you actually assess them out, there may have been a sort of a, um, a higher degree of difficulty and uh, disability that is associated with their assessment. And similarly, in patients who have physical restraints, we often assess these patients in the stretcher. Uh, they require some stress maneuvers, as uh, Dr. Hong mentioned, or this, you know, checking their blood pressure or uh, assessing their orthostasis with them standing certainly can worsen the decline of these patients, and even ambulating them is something that should be done in all of these patients with low NIH stroke seals in the initial assessment. And then again, qualification of what, what a minor or mild deficit is uh, in relation to the NIH stroke scale with reference to Dr. Gadia's questions here. Again, NIH of a four with aphasia compared to just someone who has some mild droop and drift with a sensory change can mean uh, quite different things. Uh, imaging predictors of early neurological deterioration are important too and have yet to be kind of fully clarified, but perfusion kind of playing into that. The qualification and quantification of um, how collaterals are measured in terms of uh, 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 multi-phase CTAs and everything like that and how that plays into uh, the initial assessment of the patients need to be determined as well. And so what this all comes down to is that right now there is no uh, guideline-based uh, uh, definition for what to do for these patients, and in absence of uh, a defined benefit uh, in terms of taking these patients for a thrombectomy, uh, right now the data, while obscure, uh, does not necessarily warrant taking these patients with question of worsening if they do go. I'm done. Okay, two fantastic talks. So we'll start off with any questions from the audience for our speakers. <clears throat> Dr. Malik? No, uh, there, at least as far as I recall, there really wasn't in terms of the M3s, M4s. 
uh, you know, uh, as to whether or not those patients suffer more complications, no. Good question. Any other questions from the audience? Dr. Volpe? We took patients who had like an M1 or tip of the bazar only to find out that it was chronically occluded because we had some imaging three months, six months earlier. If you only had one imaging modality to use in that acute phase to tell chronic versus acute, anything that would help us guide that decision? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, probably, probably it's kind of hard. That's a, that's a difficult question. Um, for a tip of the basilar, you know, like perfusion isn't really a good study. I think MRI might be the best study for that. Um, but yeah, you know, we, I remember one of those cases and it was just a chronic occlusion. And I think that's just, uh, you know, the, the patient having good collaterals and probably had a, 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 a that, that stroke like in the past. Um, but I think MRI is probably a good uh, marker for collaterals in that case. I think also, you know, hyperdense signs uh, on non-con CTs, you know, help, uh, especially if you have prior CTs to compare. Um, it's something to fall back to, um, but take them for yeah. Andrew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, Andrew Dr. Wong could have won that game. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Andrew graphically, you could, you could assess the collaterals quite well, but, you know, should you be taking them to Andrew Graham emergently? every time. All right, any further questions? Okay, then we'll go to our three questions and we'll, everyone has to vote similar to the last game. Uh, our first patient is a 35-year-old right-handed woman, 50-minute uh, onset uh, for this violinist with left arm sensory loss, subtle grip strength weakness, NIH stroke scale of one, and the CTA shows a right M1 occlusion. So first option is, would you treat this patient uh, medically? Uh, with uh, tenecteplase and no thrombectomy, or number two, uh, with tenecteplase and with thrombectomy. So option number one, no thrombectomy. I think we can all agree we're probably going to give this lady TNK. So, okay. And those uh, for no thrombectomy. Oh, I'm sorry, for thrombectomy. Okay, so everyone's on Dr. Wong's side. That's a point for Dr. Wong. The second patient, 75-year-old, right-handed, uh, two-hour onset of a syncopal episode and severe vertigo, inability to walk, uh, NIH stroke scale of two because ataxia doesn't count. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, gait ataxia doesn't count. CTA shows the top of the basilar. So option one, thrombectomy. Option two, no thrombectomy. Wait and watch the basilar. Okay, another win for Dr. Wong. In the third case, 95-year-old woman comes from a nursing home, found to have left-sided uh, arm weakness uh, for onset of about four hours, NIH stroke scale of two, CTA shows a right M2 occlusion. Those four thrombectomy? All right, 90-year-old granny's not getting it. Okay. <laughs> and those against thrombectomy? Okay, pretty unanimous crowd. All right, thank you, everyone.